God, we humbly come before you tonight asking you to give us power, presence, and perseverance as we go about doing this social justice work. We know that there are opponents that are outnumbered, that are our allies, but you never, ever counted numbers as in the favor of those who were doing right. You always took the least and gave it the most power. So we ask you to give this organization power, give these individuals a charge that they would leave here. And speak through me as I address them tonight and give them a word of encouragement as they go about their work in their cities. These are many blessings we ask. Count them all down. Amen. Amen. First of all, I'm incredibly honored to be here tonight. I wasn't the greatest student at week long. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of an epiphany for me. But what I will do is I will give you a brief history of how I got to this point. I, uh, I was born in a small town of Sardis, Mississippi. Segregation at the very end of Jim Crow on a self-sustaining farm that somehow my ancestors had managed to hold on to since slavery. They owned the original 39 acres and it was a self-sustaining farm. I left there in 1965, moved to Detroit for one year, had never seen two families living upstairs and downstairs from each other, had never seen black people with brand new Cadillacs, with furs, with diamonds and jewelry. My brother and my sister and I used to sit on the stoop and watch people go to the clubs on Saturday night, and just marvel at how they dress. The integrated neighborhood, the heyday of Motown and of General Motors. Moved to Milwaukee in 67, basically, almost the same thing middle class, integrated neighborhoods, not quite so integrated, they had suburbs that surrounded it, but still, I saw people flourishing, people doing well, people able to feed their families. I saw that dissipate and disappear to the fact that when we moved there, we knew everybody on both sides of the block, all around the block. We sent the kids to the playground when there were older kids on the playground, not the reverse. And I saw all of that disappear into neighborhoods where neighbor don't know neighbor, don't trust neighbor, where drugs and hopelessness came into. As David said, I spent 25 years in correction. I saw disposable people. I saw a system that was failed, that was feeding itself, that had nothing to do with correction, but more to do with warehousing. I often wondered, why I went in there with my education in journalism, how I wound up as an administrator in a jail. I often ask myself that the very second day I was there, I tell people I said, I walked out of that razor wire, looked up to heaven and said, God, what the hell did I get myself into? Mm -hmm. 25 years later, as I was packing my office, walking out of that same razor wire, God showed me, you've seen what I wanted you to see. Now go and do something about it. Mm -hmm. That is where I am today. I have sat where you sat many years ago, probably about four years ago. I went through the countless one-on-ones to the fact that I didn't remember who I did the last one with. <laughs> I got in an argument with Greg DeLuso, who is the founder of the Melium, about power. Do you want power? And I'm like, this little white man, get out of my face talking about power. I know I'm not that type of leader. We had a time. I, I still write on my evaluations. Nothing good happens after 5.30. <laughs> so I know that you've gone from 9 to 9 o'clock at night. You've marched to that dining hall like cattle to the feeding trough. You eat more than you normally would eat in a day. And you always say, how do I eat that much? But I eat lunch, breakfast, dinner every day. But it seems that you eat more at these events. Mm -hmm. I didn't leave here, St. Louis, with the greatest of feelings. Because we were on the river. We could see the arch. We could see the casino. But we didn't have time to go to either one. <laughs> <laughs> because you were encouraged to do one-on-ones, your self-interest, power, and organize people and heard that constantly over and over again to the fact that you were just tired of it. And
people kept telling you had to be this one leader, this one type of leader. So I left in that van going back to Wisconsin. I wasn't the happiest camper. So that's why you can see it's kind of strange why I'm in for you tonight. But something happened when I went to Milwaukee. That first couple of weeks, I was on the SDC board. I was on the MATC Vocational Scholarship Board. I was on the Word of Hope Ministry job training. I was on the St. Gabriel's Bible Study Board. I got rid of all of that. And I focused on one thing, what I could do to improve my community and what I could do to improve the organization. At that time, I was head of the Jobs and Economics uh, Committee for MICA. So I went back to them and said, why don't we stop knocking on doors and trying to ask people to give us jobs and find out why we don't have jobs, call the contractors in and say, what is preventing you from hiring our people? We organized 84 minority contractors that are still talking today. Six months after that, getting rid of those and becoming more involved in the jobs and economics, I became president of MICA. I looked at immigration and said, what is the biggest barrier with immigration? The churches in MICA don't know anything about immigration. They're still pitting themselves against each other, the Hispanics against black. So why don't we do something intentional to bring this conversation about? So we created Hands Across the Viaduct, which is the viaduct that separates both sides of our town. And, and we started the conversation. That is why I almost didn't come here tonight, because we're having our fourth program tonight that's going to be a rally with the black Hispanic community and we're going to go out into one of the poorest and most crime-ridden communities of Maui as a joint organization, black, white, Latino, even Native American, going to go out together passing out flyers, talking to people about what we can do to make our city better. Right. We engaged with our criminal justice system. We have done, created, bought into 11 by 15. But before that, we had joined with two of the gentlemen that are here with, with you today from the walking table of the saints who began to have an open conversation about how do we reform the prison system. And we started realizing that we could do that if we started the conversation and began to talk about it. We began to seize power. That little white man I was working with that here at We Belong in St. Louis, that little conversation began to resonate with me and I had started seizing power that I argued with him for about 10 minutes that I didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> what you are being charged with here today is that same thing, is that same thing, because not many people get it. Not many people can see what you have seen this week. Not many people can be as frustrated as you would this week and not go home. So I know that some of you have negotiated the Malayans into oblivion. <laughs> some of you allowed the Athenians to be your leaders. Some of you thought that the, the, the Greeks and whatever was going to come, that, that you thought that you had it. Some of you got kicked out of the room. Who got kicked out of the room? Because you were indecisive. Some of you wanted to go home that first day because it was frustrating. I called this organizer boot camp. You had the drill sergeants who were in your face all day trying to find out your, your self-interest. Ladies and gentlemen, your self-interest is the human race. Your self-interest is your neighbor. Your self-interest is that person sitting beside you. John said that most of you would not contact each other again but I'm going to tell you, most of you are going to start coming back to these trainings because it does something inside of you. It makes you look at yourself. That's what we're trying to do to America now. Make America look in the mirror and take a good look at yourself and see are you doing what you're supposed to be doing. Amen. Are you doing what all of the documents say that you're doing? We have to realize that we can change it just with us, just with this one little group here could go out and change the world. God never looked at numbers when he tried to do something. He always looked at the heart of the people. 
fact that you stayed here, the fact that you're waiting here tonight, let me know that you have bought into something here. Bought into something that is very, very, very valuable to you. Now, one of the things that I did with Micah, and it might seem like rocket science, but it's not. Intentionally and deliberately built relationships with unions, with other religious organizations, with the Sikh temple, with the Jewish synagogues. Find out the programs they're going and go to them. You don't always have to be in charge of something that you belong to. You can humble yourself and go and become a part of something else and start promoting yourself. Start promoting. I know that y'all did press conferences this week. Start doing press releases with whatever you do. Start getting your name and your intention out there and start knocking on your mayor's door. Stop marching around with signs all the time. That's good to get attention, but you got to get into the doorways, into the conference rooms. You got to start sitting at the table. Martin Luther King did the rest of that for us. It's time for us to be that beloved community that God intended for us to be. Because we still got to reach northern Wisconsin. Because we got a governor that has pitted the major city, Milwaukee, against the entire state. And we've got to get a word to the entire state to let them know they're human beings in Milwaukee. They're different color. They might live in different areas. They don't have farm, but they breathe the same air. They bleed the same blood. And they still want the same thing for their children. We are no different. That's what you have to take from here. That's what you have to take back to your cities and your organizations. And yes, you're going to have cancer in your organization. Because there are going to be people who say you can't. There are going to be people saying, we've never done this before. There are going to be people saying that you're spreading us too thin. But I'll tell them all the time, the things that we're doing today, we should have did yesterday. And the right. things that we did yesterday, we should have been doing last week. Right. We are behind the curve. So those people that are going to be naysayers, you either have to shut the deaf ear to them or leave them behind. Because they will thwart your progress. They will get rid of your dream. The only thing that you've got going for you right now is your energy and your willingness to keep at it. And I always tell my organization we're on a mission from God. I never remove that from in front of them. Whatever your belief is, whatever you count in, rely on that because that is what's going to get you through. 